Hey, welcome back, everyone. We're here with another show, Q&A. We have a lot of questions lined up, so I always like to just dive right in, but just have to make sure that you don't um, take any of this advice at face value. Just check with your doctor before implementing any of the things that we're going to discuss today because um, they have to approve it first. Okay. All right. well, let's dive right in. I'm going to tell you what we're going to discuss first, and that is that Terry told me that it's National Keto Day so well, it's about time they have a, a national keto day. I know, and if they know that. anyone deserves to erect a bronze statue for this day, it must be Dr. Berg. So we'll keep an eye out for that. But welcome everyone who has successfully changed their lives because of Dr. Berg's clean keto approach to stuff. So let's kick it right off with uh, some social media stuff. We got a full green room too, which we'll get to. But let's start with Bonnie from YouTube. What are the fractional LDL particles, and how do they influence our LDL levels? Good question. Well, you got the small, uh, dense, dense fraction particle size, and then you have the large buoyant. So, what what determines each one is really the 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 environment that you're in. Like, if you have a lot of insulin resistance, you're going to get more of the the small dense, which have the ability to to penetrate deeply into um, the layer of the inside of your artery and create damage, whereas the large buoyant are not pathogenic. So really, if you take a look at those from the viewpoint of a risk factor for heart disease, there's something that's even more of a risk factor, and it's kind of a specialized test that you can get, and it's, uh, it's called, um, what is it called? It is called... Uh, lipoprotein insulin resistance score. Lipoprotein. So basically, they measure the the insulin resistance on that that lipoprotein itself, which is really interesting because out of all the risk factors, that would be at the top of the list. So that if you have that, then that just tells you you're not in good shape. So um, you know when you're evaluating all these biomarkers from your blood, fats, lipids, things like that. It's really important to get the whole picture. And I think uh, a test that's going to really um, take over this field to create less confusion is called a metabolomic test, because that way you could look at the whole picture, um, which, which that um, lipoprotein insulin resistance is one of those biomarkers as well. So you can kind of really get a picture of what's happening, takes the person's diet, their genetic stuff, their medication, and really get a good picture so you're treating the patient, not the specific biomarker itself. You know, we're not, like sometimes you go to a doctor and you're like, oh, you have high LDL, but they didn't look at these, these particle sizes and they treat you with statins. They're treating the biomarker, they're not treating the patient. I mean, if you went through an infection or you go through stress or you're postmenopausal, your LDLs could go up. So LDL is part of the healing healing phase. And um, uh, so it's, it's not, it's, there's a lot more to know about it and you don't have to be scared of, of it if it's high, because it could be just part of the healing process. Very good, Bonnie. I hope that helps you. Let's go on to ZZ from YouTube. I regularly get cramps in my hand and fingers. What could be causing this doctor? Typically the magnesium is what I would look at. It can also be uh, potassium or other electrolytes. So you know, you want to look at your diet. Are you having enough potassium? Are you having enough magnesium? I have videos on this. Or maybe it's you're not having enough sodium. Yeah, right. Sodium, low sodium can cause cramps as well. So that's another thing to look at. All right, very good. Scooby Doozy from YouTube. Uh, it, we were hoping to hear from you. Is it okay to follow keto and a low carb diet if you have arterial, uh, arterial fibrillation, AFib? I don't know what else diet you would go on that uh, would be better than that. You want to do the healthy version of the ketogenic diet because the term keto really just means low carb. So it doesn't talk about ingredients. So we want the higher quality, healthy version. So you get all the nutrients and all the protective factors from the phytonutrients as well. Um, but I think um, that would be a good thing to do. Uh, if you have atrial fib or any type of... Um, alteration in the heartbeat itself, arrhythmias, um, you really want to also beef up, no pun intended, your electrolytes. 
So that's a really kind of a key factor there because as soon as you run out of those, your electrical system could be out of balance. All right, very good. <clears throat> Jacqueline from YouTube. My mom is 75 and has severe hiatal hernia. From what I've learned, <clears throat> excuse me, from you, it could be caused by low stomach acid. Is it too late to treat her condition naturally? It's too late. I'm sorry. It's over. You can't. No, uh, absolutely. It's not too late. I think you can do something about it. I would try. I always uh, like to take the viewpoint of let's let's see if we can improve it to some degree. So start taking that stomach acid, do some of that um, acupressure stuff underneath the, the stomach so you can kind of um, manipulate the congestion in the lower part of the stomach. So maybe that can help as well. Okay, very good. Rumble's chiming in this morning. In this case, the uh, listener's name or his handle is Rumble8827. And he's from Rumble. So thank you, Rumble8827. And he says he's been listening to you for a long time and passing along good information to my friends and relatives and customers. We all appreciate your efforts to help people from all uh, over the world. Thank you. And that's coming from Rumble. So thank you, the burgeoning Rumble audience, uh, for chiming in. And we love to hear questions from you uh, as well. And to that end, here's Bike51 from Rumble. I'm 72 and want to lose some weight. I take many of your supplements and I'm in pretty good health. I do take uh, Synthoid 88. Uh, am I too old to go on keto and IF? And as you said before, absolutely no hope for you. Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, I think you're too old for keto because keto is only for uh, people under the age of 70. No, it's actually, I think it'd be very helpful. I, I would try it. I think it might help you. All right, very good. Hand slipped off the button. Why don't we acknowledge people uh, and where they're coming from this morning? And by the way, we're proud to have um, a listener from South Africa. We'll have him on. He's waiting patiently in the green room. Uh, and beyond him in Montreal, we have another a nice gentleman from there. We'd like to say a good morning and happy keto day to all to our viewers joining us this morning from the UK, Canada, Mexico, Albania, Pakistan, excuse me, Palestine. New Zealand, Portugal, Peru, Ireland, Chile, Aruba, Finland, um, uh, St. Lucie, St. Lucia. Thank you, Terry, for doing that phonetically for me. Nigeria, Croatia, Croatia, excuse me, Thailand, the Czech Republic, Scotland, Sweden, Poland, uh, the Dominican Republic, Greece, Egypt, Trinidad and Tobago, the Netherlands, the Congo <coughs> Republic, Romania, Mozambique, Turkey, Argentina, the United Arab Emirates, Bermuda, uh, Bermuda, Israel, Denmark, France, Australia, Oman, India, Cyprus, Pakistan, uh, Calcutta, uh, Tasmania, Brunei, China, Eritrea, Nepal, Iran, Jordan, Bosnia, uh, and Herzegovina. Don't want to forget that second part. Dubai, Ethiopia, Morocco, Germany, uh, Ghana, the Virgin Islands, Uzbekistan, Qatar, Switzerland, Slovakia, Kashmir, Norway, Zambia, been there, Sri Lanka, Colombia, Belgium, the Bahamas, South Korea, drum roll, and all across these United States. So thanks so much for everyone. And happy New Year. Uh, 2024 is going to be great, I'm sure, around the globe for health and so on. Okay, Darlene from YouTube, what are the most common causes of bone loss? You see this uh, as someone ages, especially like postmenopausal, because of the shift of certain hormones like estrogen too. It can also occur from a higher level of cortisol because cortisol tends to uh, eat up proteins as well. One of the side effects of synthetic pro, uh, cortisol like prednisone is bone loss. So uh, to get osteoporosis, uh, you know, um, it's not a, a, a minor thing. It's something major. You have to kind of find out from the person's history what is going on. Uh, and so you can bring it back, but you have to look at all these factors, diet, the micronutrients, it's not just about calcium. The calcium is <laughs> is involved, but it's not the big thing. Uh, vitamin D is involved, but it's uh, not the the major thing in osteoporosis. Osteomalacia, yes. Uh, rickets, yes. So um, all these uh, things you have to look at, and I think um, I, I think estrogen and cortisol have a big big impact on on your bones, and also a loss of vitamin K two. All right. Very good. Thank you, Doc. And thank you for spending all your time coming up with these great questions. And here's the first one for today. Okay. In which tissue does the autoimmune function? All right. So I'm going to rephrase this question because um, 
somehow this got mixed in translation, okay? Uh -oh. In what tissue does autoimmune diseases begin in your body? Okay, what tissue does the autoimmune diseases uh, start in your body? Okay, I am going to by default blame Terry for that, even though it may be my boo-boo. But uh, he's going to go on the record as, as have screwing up that question as far as I'm concerned. All right, let's go back to social media. This time, Darling from YouTube, what are the most common causes of, uh, of bone loss? Yeah, we... Uh, I, I think we, we just covered we that did. one, if I'm not mistaken, you are, but we can talk about it again if you want. Well, then it sounds like it's likely that that was definitely my fault, the way I'm botching things. Linda from Facebook, if a food is too high in carbs, like oatmeal, would adding, oh gosh, facilium husk powder, facilium husk powder, bring down the carb count so as to remain in keto, ketosis? Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit. I mean, sometimes you can add various things like, fat, especially to buffer this uh, spike in insulin. It really depends on the type of carbohydrate you're using and also the type of fat and the person as well. I mean, it's kind of an individual thing. I, I, would, I would not try to recommend start adding things to try to buffer it. I would just kind of avoid some, some of these grains. But um, yeah, it really depends on a lot of factors and the type of fiber. But uh, the psyllium seed... Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if that would do too much or not. Okay, and a shout out. Let's add to our list uh, from our viewers in Guyana, the Philippines, Jamaica, South Africa, and Spain. And again, we've got a guest from South Africa, but there's someone else down there that is uh, chiming in. So I think that's terrific. Let's see. Uh, oh, here's one, Natasha, and this time from Facebook. What are your thoughts on the best diet for a toddler with autism? That's a challenge. Boy, I would just, I would highly recommend to do um, what we recommend for everyone else. Just omit the intermittent fasting because you're dealing with um, brain inflammation and uh, you want to um, provide some of the key nutrients. I mean, have you, Steve, have you ever seen what some of these kids are unfortunately eating? Um, I mean, it's just, you know, they have the Happy Meal, which is this seed oils and processed food. And then you have a, um, and the grocery stores, you know, these all these little kids are eating just pure synthetic food. It's not even sh sugar and, and starches. It's like a synthetic version of the starches, the sugars, and the oils. So it's uh, I would uh, there's a couple things with autism related to um, you know sulforaphane. Apparently, it helps autism. So that's like in broccoli sprouts. So you can do that. Um, try to get your child on on the on the whole foods okay whole foods um nothing uh refined nothing um with a long shelf life nothing in a box nothing in a can just like real food whole food that would be something i would do yeah when i was uh, they've been at that for a long time when i was a kid and the rest of my generation Wonder Bread, the white Wonder Bread helps build strong bodies 12 ways. No, I don't know how that really? was. That was the it slogan. Does. I didn't it, know does. That. it sure does. Luckily, you know, we didn't eat much as kids and we were running around the block constantly. So we probably burn off all those autism causing uh, nutrients, quote unquote. But anyway, they've been at that for some time. So tricks you know, are for Steve, kids. You know, it's funny because you, you, uh, you can, you know, you have the, you have these sugars and the bad sugars and you also have the starches and then you have the oils. So, I mean, yes, you can burn off some of these sugars and get away with it, right? But you you don't burn off these oils, these seed oils. They kind of get lodged in your cells. I mean, you and they get stuck there. They have a, a half life of I think two and a half to three years. So you start accumulating all these uh, unsaturated seed oils called vegetable oils, which is kind of ironic because they don't have any vegetable that I know in that oil. And uh, then you start to create um, inflammation. So yeah, this is definitely um, probably at the top of the list as far as the worst food or worst thing that you can consume is the seed oils. All right, very good. Why don't we go to our first contestant, if you will, participant in the green room. And her name is Ernestine, but she has a cute name, Ernie. That's what she's gone by since she was a little one. And she's on with us with her one question that she will now uh, professionally belt out in 30 seconds. And un <laughs> Ernie, go ahead with your question. Hi, 
Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, my main question is that I have a lymph node on the right side of my neck <clears throat> that has been swollen for over two years, and I did have it biopsied. Um, and they said that it was nothing that was concerning, but it bothers me, and I do feel a little feverish on that side. So I was wondering if you had any, like, recommendations. Is it on the right side? On the right. Mm -hmm. Are you doing keto yet or no? No, not yet. Okay, so... <clears throat> You know, I've seen this in practice and, you know, you, you try to do research and you really can't find anything about it. Uh, I have noticed a higher correlation with um, liver congestion and the right side of the lymphatic system more congested than the left. Because, um, I don't know if you know this, but a really big part of the liver is the immune system. In fact, it has these cells called the Kupfer cells, which are immune cells. They're like little lymphoid like little lymphatic tissue inside your liver. When that backs up, it can go right up to that chain up to underneath your neck there. So what I would do if I were you is I would uh, get on this um, thing. It's called healthy keto plan. I would get on that. You could probably find it on my website. Start cleaning out your liver, start eating healthy foods, and just see if that doesn't just disappear. So uh, that way you're not like treating it directly like some weird thing. I think it's connected to something a little bit bigger. Okay. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Wow. Thank you for being the absolute best contestant for the day so far. <laughs> Ernie, you set a great standard and, uh, you know, we hope that helps. And any of those folks that come on with us uh, from social media or from our television cameras, if you will, we'd love to hear back from you and see if uh, some of these suggestions helped you uh, improve your uh, various conditions. So thank you again, Ernie, for a succinct call. Let's go back to, uh, well, gosh, the first quiz question of the day, uh, the audience, now brilliant, leapt right on it. And it asked, in what tissue does the autoimmune disease, is that what you corrected it to, Doc, function yeah. begin and where in our bodies? Yeah. Once again, Terry's fault. And uh, the respondents, 55% uh, said that it's the gut or gut lining, 30% say cognitive issue, 10% say the thyroid and 5% say it's the liver. Any, any correct answers there? Yeah, it's, it's the gut. It's, the, it's your uh, intestinal lining, this, specifically the small intestine, okay? The small intestine. That's where it starts, which is interesting because then, you're, then it brings up a whole question of what could possibly interfere with that tissue other than everything you're eating, right? And then you have, okay, well, out of all those foods, what – what is the most damaging to that lining, uh, the, the mucosal lining of your intestine, right? So then you get into all this information that's uh, very, very um, relevant to autoimmune diseases, um, especially when you do history. I think it's kind of like a perfect storm. You have several things occur, and then you develop this autoimmune disease. Um, and so, yeah, autoimmune diseases... Are, are, are higher right now than heart disease and cancer. And, um, and just like sky high, it's inflammatory conditions. And so um, there's things that we're eating. And, and, and this trend started in the 70s and 80s. Okay, so uh, that might give you a clue, but you'll have to stay tuned for more videos on the entire story. I'm gonna do a whole complete video on it. All right, very good. Uh, let's see, we really look forward to hearing from Lady Trucker Toes. She's back from Rumble, <clears throat> and she wants to know, what's your opinion on fluoride? I have been fluoride-free now for 20 years. Is she on the right path, Doc? I think she is. Uh, yeah, I don't like fluoride. I, I, have, I think it's called, uh, let's see, what is that? Um, there's a company, Crystal, is it Crystal Health? Crystal Water Filters? I can't remember, but I... I did recommend it at one time, but they have a water filter, a pitcher, a whole house one as well, but you can get this pitcher for $39 to, to filter out specifically fluoride, which I do not like in the, the tap water because um, it affects your skin, it affects your thyroid. I mean, it's like toxic. Um, and so, and if you could get one for your shower, I don't know where you could find one of those, like a shower head, your skin will be much better. But uh, yeah, that fluoride is pretty... Um, nasty you know steve when you a lot of people buy bottled water it's expensive it's like if you if you add up all these small bottles it comes out to like 12 dollars a gallon for water right and of course we don't want to drink the tap water so we buy bottled water so um 
I, I calculated recently because I'm really good at math. The um, the cost of what it would cost if you get just that filter, which filters out, it's thirty nine bucks. Filters out um, two thousand gallons, right? That comes down from twelve dollars to one penny per gallon. So you could really um, save a lot by getting like a water pitcher at least uh, if you were doing versus the bottled water. So anyway, it's um, something to think about because that water is so expensive. Absolutely. We do have a filter on our, um, our refrigerator and they're $20 and 40 and 50. I never know which one to get, but I Amazon one in and I change it every six months. So, um, you know, is there a guide yeah. to what's a good water filter and what's, um, there, there's that company I'm not affiliated, but it's called, uh, it's called crystal something. I'll have to, I'll find it and I'll put, put a link down below. I have it in one of my videos. If you type Dr. Berg water filter, you'll probably find it. Chris, yeah, it's crystal something, I think. And uh, that's a good one. Uh, there's, other, there's other ones too, but this one is like a four layer system that really just cleans everything out. The pesticides, heavy metals, country and Western, things like that. <laughs> Very good. Okay, Anita from YouTube. Uh, do I have to take multivitamin if I'm taking a complete organ meat supplement? Organ meat supplement. What would you recommend? Yes, you do have to take it. Now, no, you don't have to take it. Now, if you're doing an organ supplement, I mean, that's going to, that is your multivitamin mineral. That is your multi, you're getting all the fat soluble, you're getting the B vitamins, but I don't think you're getting enough vitamin C. Uh, you might not be getting um, the potassium, but you're definitely going to get most of the nutrients. Okay. Uh, let's see. Shirley looks like she's fasting from YouTube. Will organic, Whipping cream, no sugar, all fat, break my fast. Is it carbs or calories that break a fast? It's both. Um, but, but fat has a lesser degree of, of, of breaking your fast because it, it doesn't stimulate insulin as much. However, it does to a small degree because as soon as it hits your small intestine, it can increase it. So, so in other words, if you're trying to achieve this goal of autophagy that you're trying to do, or maybe getting the ketosis and you're eating all this fat and you're thinking that it's not interfering, <laughs> it is. So it's really about the calorie, cutting down the calories down to zero. That's a true fast. Um, but if you compare that to carbs, it's much better. All right, very good. Let's go for question number two for the day, hoping that we typed it correctly. Okay, if LDL, because we've talked about LDL just recently, if LDL is bad cholesterol, then why does it have such a key function in delivering cholesterol to make hormones, cell membranes, bile salts, and vitamin D? So in other words, I think most people know that uh, our bodies make cholesterol, and they also know the purpose of cholesterol is to do all these things, but maybe they didn't know that the transport system is LDL, because LDL goes from your liver to the cells, and then HDL goes from the cell back to the liver. So you may have not known that LDL has a purpose. So the question is, if LDL was so bad, then why does it do these things? That's an excellent question. All right, let's see, Tanum12 from Rumble again. Thanks Rumble for chiming in so much. Uh, please share your thoughts on the causes and treatment of GBS, uh, gn Barre syndrome. Uh-oh. Oh, Gillian Barr's uh, syndrome? Uh, well, maybe. Gillian Barre? Uh, yes, that's, okay, that's so right. I think this is, this is an autoimmune disease. And um, again, I think, you know, you have to work on the gut. You have to work on the gut. You have to eliminate foods that irritate the gut. I will do a video on this. I have done videos on this. I'll do an additional, additional one. But um, you want to, um, at the top of the list, seed oils have to go bye-bye. And also the the gluten and the grains, the grains have to, there's too many things in grains that irritate the gut. So why would you do them? It doesn't make sense. Um, so um, the other thing, uh, this is a lot of people go on the carnivore diet and they, they clear up their autoimmune diseases because they eliminate all these different factors. But if I were to do the, um, that diet, I would do a higher quality meat, and the grass-fed, grass-finished. I would do something like that. Um, um, you know, in this, um, 
in the grass fed, grass finished versus the grain fed, um, you're dealing with a, a lot of interesting things in that grass fed, grass finished. You're dealing with a much higher levels of phytonutrients. Now, these are plant-based chemicals in the beef. So we don't really know exactly what they do. Some people say, oh yeah, it's a, it's a toxin, whatever. But is it really? Because it, you know, it could create what's called an epigenetic effect. You know, that little toxic effect can actually create some beneficial effects in our bodies, just like exercise does. I mean, exercise is destructive on your body, but why do we do it? Because it epigenetically improves things or, or cold therapy. Why would you ever want to do cold therapy? That's like painful, but then the epigenetic effect on that as well. So, or fasting, why would you want to starve yourself? Right? So all these things, um, especially with the phytonutrients, we don't know the effects that they create right now. We may find just like when, uh, vit like we found that vitamin B1, we need to be one or else you're going to get berry berry or some other nutrient, vitamin C or scurvy. We don't know, um, how important or how not important these phytonutrients are. You call them like secondary uh, metabolites, but they could be just as important. Well, time will tell once the research goes, but the, the point is that it does help uh, the animal uh, for health and, um, and it could help us as well. So why not step it up and do a higher quality uh, grass-fed type food? All right. Jack from Theory. Rumble, once again, what is your opinion on urolithin A supplements, which apparently revitalizes the mitochondria? You heard of that? What was that again? It was um, uh, urolithin A, urolithin A supplement. I don't, I don't know what that is. All right. Well, I hope it's helping you, yeah. Jack, and maybe we'll, uh, Terry's bound to do some research on that, so we'll hear back from him, I'm sure. Olivia from YouTube, is there a natural way to treat spinal stenosis? This is a situation on the spinal column where you have uh, the, the spinal cord is, is, uh, is not quite, it's not, there's not enough space in, the, in the, uh, the spinal column for the cord. So we have pressure on the spinal cord. And so um, this could come from uh, several different things. You know, it could come from a protruded disc, things like that. But I think it also can come from a buildup of um, calcium that could develop because you're lacking vitamin K2. There's a little bit of data on that. Um, also, it could come from inflammation. So the way I would address this is I would just, instead of trying to treat it, I would really check with the person to make sure that their diet is, is right so there's not a lot of inflammation, make sure they have enough vitamin K2, and, um, and then see if it doesn't go away. But I think um, so many people, they go for the surgery, but they haven't really tried the the other ways first, because there's, it's hard to find research on this because there's not a lot of research on it. So um, that would be two things I would do. Okay, very good. Let's go back to our green, roll, uh, green room. Excuse me. This time, Johan, who is currently, he's German, but he's currently in Montreal and speaks all sorts of languages, which always makes me jealous. And uh, if you've unmuted yourself, Johan, you are on with Dr. Berg for your quick question. Thank you. Uh Aside from uh, trying to find out what supplement I can use to get a good night's sleep. Mm. Yes, yes. I think, um, do you have, do you find that you have a hard time getting to sleep? Or do you get to sleep and you wake up prematurely? Both. Okay. Do you find that uh, you have a lot of uh, thinking before bed, like a lot of stress type stuff? Or is that an issue? I usually do meditation and breathing exercises before going to bed, half an hour. Okay. So, so um, a couple things that, that uh, help uh, sleep. Uh, uh, B1, that helps you get to sleep because it probably supports the first part of the sleep. The, part of the, the first part of sleep is really um, involving the parasympathetics. That's that, it's like a push down wave that pushes you into the deep, what's called the delta wave. And that's supported by B1. So uh, that should help you with the first part. And then you get the sympathetic, which is kind of the REM sleep, because that's almost like the wavelength is almost similar to being awake, 
but you're asleep and you need that as well. And it kind of goes in waves. So that could be supported um, with vitamin D and even a little calcium. So, um, so you might want to try some vitamin D like 10,000 I use right before bed and a little calcium. Uh, sometimes uh, a little zinc does help your sleep as well. Uh, but that's, that's what comes to mind right off the bat. There's other things you can do, uh, but those, uh, those are good. Um, I've also found that people do, that do a probiotic before bed helps. Um, I also find the person who does um, more salt right before bed tends to sleep better as well. The sodium helps calm down that flight or fight mechanism. So, um, I mean, you could do it right before bed, or you could just take more salt during the day. Um, if you are, are you get is your urination waking you up too, or no? Uh, on occasion, if I'm a light sleeper, then I'll get up two, three times. Yeah, and so for that, that's a classic uh, insulin resistance. So you just want to get on the uh, the keto and the intermittent fasting, and do that for a period of time until that completely goes up. It takes more time for that. Um, some people. Uh, sleep much better if their meal and the last meal of the day is like maybe an early dinner, like maybe at four, and then they ha they don't eat anything after that. That usually will help sleeping as well because they don't have that food sitting on their stomach. Um, I also find if I don't do some type of vigorous exercise, my sleep isn't that that quality too. So something that actually gets your body to use up that energy is also important too. Thank you. You're welcome. Wow, we have the absolute most disciplined uh, green room participants uh, in history today. Uh, I know, Ernie, I'm, I'm amazed. I know, Ernie kicked it off and she set a standard that Johan just followed. So thank you all so much for your great uh, effort in keeping the show missing, uh, moving along. Okay, let's see. Um, quiz question, oh no, let's see, Rosebud. Uh, Okay, Rosebud from Rumble, 1818. What are your thoughts on taking glucosamine chondroitin for joint pain? I like it. I like it. I think it works great. Joint inflammation, arthritis. Uh, yeah, I, I would uh, highly recommend it um, for any type of arthritis, for sure. All right, Doc, I'm batting zero today. I just erased question uh, number two. Two. I don't think we answered that, did we? Uh, let's, what was? Uh, well, that's what was the, the problem. I erased it. I, I tell you what. I'm going to rely on um, rely on Terry to clue me on that. Let's move on, and we'll get back to that. Eva from Facebook. I'm 60 years old and had a coronary calcium scan done and have a moderate calcification score of 167. What would you recommend to bring down that score? Yeah, so this is a score that measures the calcium in the uh, in certain arteries, uh, like the coronary, coronary artery. And uh, you want it to be zero. Um, you're in the low range. I mean, it can go up to over 1,000, so that's good. But I would take that as a kind of a marker to then compare it to over time. If it's improving over time, that's what you want to see. So I think you can always improve it. But you're going to have to take the viewpoint of like calcium is like spackle and it's like a healing, it's a healing mechanism. There's something going on in your arteries that are, was inflamed and now that calcium had to come to spackle it to uh, put a bandaid over it. So um, the seed oils, you want to eliminate that. So in other words, if you're doing um, salad dressing, switch to olive oil and uh, vinaigrette, some type of that, uh, salad dressing. If you're doing mayonnaise, make your own with olive oil and egg yolk and some mustard. Don't, don't get the, uh, the stuff from the store. You can get the, um, the um, avocado oil one, but a lot of times they'll mix the seed oils right in there. So I would start to avoid that. I would also take um, one of the most um, powerful antioxidants that you can take for the inside of the arteries would be the to tocotrienols. So that would be another thing I would take. I would also um, follow my, my eating plan with intermittent fasting. And I would also take vitamin K2 with that D3 uh, just to kind of see if you could remove some of the calcium once you get rid of that inflammatory state. Uh, again, the, the CAC score is just one biomarker that you should look at 
with other things as well. You want to take a complete picture of what's going on. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Back to question number two. It asked if LDL is bad cholesterol, then why does it have such an important function delivering cholesterol to make hormones, membranes, bile, and vitamin D? And the uh, audience did not forget the question, and they came back with 75% saying that LDL cholesterol has a good function in limited amounts. 25% say LDL cholesterol is only bad if your body contains too much. Uh, so what do you think? Is there some wisdom there? Okay, so, so the thing that what you want to look at with LDL is uh, it's a, a carrier of cholesterol. Okay, just a carrier of cholesterol. And there's a, there's a certain, there's different types of LDL. Okay, there's a, there's a type of LDL that um, is more pathogenic and uh, it's, it's going to be the small dense, but also there's a, there's a term uh, oxidative LDL, which basically it's oxidized. Um, I don't want to add more confusion, but just realize that there's a, there's a pathogenic bad type of LDL that occurs um, when you have insulin resistance. So really, when you're looking at LDL, you really want to realize that uh, it's not going to be a problem as long as you don't have insulin resistance. <laughs> so if you have insulin resistance, you're going to have a problem with LDL. That's really the bottom line. So that relates to, well, then what is insulin resistance? Well, that's a, that's a situation. It's a protective mechanism where your body is trying to protect against excess insulin because there's excess sugars and starches and things like that uh, and junk food. So you'd want to limit that. And this is what we've been talking about for the last uh, 20 years. So uh, get the junk out of the trunk, get rid of the breads, pasta, cereal, crackers, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, muffins, sodas, juice, and um, you'll find that you'll be in healthy shape. Okay, let's see. Um... Patty from YouTube, I've been adjusting to eating just two meals a day, but find I'm now getting regular headaches. Will they eventually go away as I make this plan more of a regular routine? Yeah, it will. And I think I would just add um, that sea salt. I think you're just needing sea salt. You know, I consume a lot of salt. And, uh, and I find I just do so much better with more salt. So especially if you're doing like one, a day, one meal a day and People just like they may salt their food, but I salt everything. And I actually take salt in my electrolyte. I take my electrolyte powder in the morning with lemon juice and I dump um, some sea salt in there, dissolve it, slug it down. Um, I think um, your headaches will go right away if you did that right now. All right, very good. Quiz question number three. And here it is, Doc. Okay. How does exposing your body to cold trigger fat burning? How could it possibly do that? Very hopeful stuff, although it's chilly. Let's see. Um, Eva. Okay. Uh, let's see. Anika, we did that. Diane from Facebook. I'm trying to do keto. Is it beneficial to drink ketones that put me in ketosis in 30 minutes? That's interesting. I would only do that if you have you have a lot of extra money on your hand and you also have, um, you want to maybe use it to get more energy with exercise, but there is no way that's going to help your weight loss because your body is just going to be using that as fuel instead of your own fat. And uh, so I think it does have some beneficial effects for people with Alzheimer's, dementia, things like that, because it drives the ketones right to the brain and maybe exercise. But other than that, I, I wouldn't waste your money. Very good. Let's go back uh, once again to keep up with things to the green room. And why don't we go to South Africa this time uh, to Zwilaka okay. and uh, Zwilaki. Let's see his. Can you hear us? His picture's frozen. Can you hear us, sir? Um, I see his, his his he's muted, too. Oh, good. So can you unmute yourself, sir? And if we can hear you, we'll go with your conversation instead of your picture. All right. Let's hope that he can get reconnected or whatever. And uh, let's see, why don't we go to Max. Max, are you ready to go on the air with and follow suit with everyone else that uh, kept things so succinct? And let's see, go ahead and talk to me, sir. Oh, yes, we sure can. Hang on a second, I'll get you up on the big screen. There you are. Go ahead with your question, sir. 
Uh, hi, doctor. So uh, I'm a history of a higher bilirubin, around 1.8, and uh, was higher cholesterol. So they put me on a statin, uh, and uh, AL, my ALT uh, started going up. And I also done an MRI. Nothing was found really. It was that the gallbladder, gallbladder was a little bit enlarged. And I do exercise regularly. I do hot sauna, cold plunge. And I feel a little bit sleepy also, so that's mm. about it. So, so what basically the problem is you have um, higher liver enzymes, and you're also taking a statin, right? Yes, well, and ALT only went up when I start taking the statin. Ah, My ALT was fine. My cholesterol bilirubin was higher prior to taking statins, and there's the, there are four they put in the statins, so five milligram rosova statin. Yeah. Yeah, I totally understand. Like, I just have to just first say I can't tell you not to come off the medication, but I will say that those statins block the enzyme for cholesterol. Now, I mean, there's a there's a higher risk now of developing muscle problems, everything related to your muscles uh, and liver problems too. That's why the enzymes went up. So um, instead of I don't know. My thought is maybe you want to get with your doctor and say, hey, instead of like treating the cholesterol, can't we do this another way through diet? Can't we do this through exercise? Um, maybe um, you take niacin, which is one of the best natural uh, remedies for high cholesterol. And uh, the other question is, um, um, you know, is it really a genetic problem or not? If it's not, then why are we why are you putting on the medication? The other other key thing with all statins, if you're not, I don't know if you're taking coenzyme Q10, but hopefully he puts you on that because that's the one that really tanks down there. And you need this coenzyme Q10 in your mitochondria for the transportation of those electrons through there. And if you don't have that, um, boy, you you can have fatigue big time. You can have all sorts of mitochondrial damage. So. Um, I'm not a fan of statins, as you can tell, because it's again, it's like you're treating you're treating one biomarker. Like, what about the? Why don't you treat the patient? Why don't you find out why the cholesterol is high? Uh, I would I would highly recommend going back to your doctor and say, don't we need cholesterol to build membranes, hormones, testosterone, cortisol to handle stress? Don't we need it for our vitamin D and to make bile? Um, why would I want to lower it? You know, and uh, so there's a lot of also additional data that shows that when you have high cholesterol, if it's if it's total cholesterol, um, it's you're not at risk for heart problems. And so that's it's kind of like um, they call it the cholesterol con, because for all these years, cholesterol's gotten a bad name, and all of a sudden, but it's ingrained in in the medical profession in our minds that it's bad, it's bad, and we got to get rid of cholesterol. Um, but as far as a bilirubin, uh, elevated bilirubin. Bilirubin, okay, bilirubin. That's that's um, that's a little bit different. That's not cholesterol. That is the byproduct of your uh, red blood cells. So uh, that's usually something going on with the liver. So you'd want to support the liver and do things to help the liver. Um, milk thistle is a really good one. Uh, tutka is one of my favorites as well. And then making sure that you get on the right eating plan too is going to be really important. But I'm assuming that you're already eating perfectly. So, yeah. Can you, doctor, remind me what for the replacement, I mean, not replacement, alternative for the statins, what, what you mentioned, Q10, coenzyme? Coenzyme Q10. That should always be taken if someone's on a statin because statins, you see the, the biochemical pathway that blocks cholesterol it's the same pathway as the coenzyme Q10. So you're basically Q? shutting off uh, both of those things. A, sorry, is that Q as a query? Q? Coenzyme Q10. Coen. And what was the other medicine you recommended? Tudka. And these are not medications, by the way. Tudka, T U D C A. Mm -hmm. And then uh, milk thistle. It's a good one. Yeah, I've been taking milk thistle, but I think really didn't have much change. Okay, well then go with these other ones and then definitely um, follow the eating plan that I recommend for sure. 
and then work with your doctor on your, your medications. Thank you so much. Hey, you're welcome. Great. Another great uh, green room performance. Thank you, Max, so much. Get back with us and let us know if things improve for you. Uh, Dr. Burke is concerned with everyone's health, which is obvious. Let's see. Um, <laughs> Michael Rock Art from Rumble. How many sardines do we have to eat to get enough iodine every day? You think that's the best approach, Doc? That's a three point. Uh, it's usually about three point four uh, sardines. Uh, now, I, <laughs> I don't know. You'd have to see uh, how much iodine is in a sardine. I haven't checked recently. Um, iodine is in uh, seafood, so um, you know you're going to get some iodine. On, but I, I think, uh, you know, sh any type of the shellfish, you can get more iodine, or even uh, sea kelp, you can get the iodine from there as well. Um, there's a little bit of iodine in sea salt, but not probably as much as you would get. Okay, very good. Let's see. Um, Sheham, Sheham uh, from Facebook, what do you think about consuming cayenne pepper with our foods? What are the primary benefits of taking cayenne pepper? You know, this, the cayenne pepper as a spice, it's good for uh, uh, pain inflammation it's a powerful antioxidant it does a lot of things um these antioxidants uh can help um kind of uh mitigate some of the pollution the bad foods that we eat um just the general uh oxidative stress that happens with life so i think um it, it could be beneficial um especially if you put it on some hot wings and uh, i'm just being sarcastic Okay, let's see. Poor Joanne from YouTube. I've been anemic for 10 years. I had an iron infusion procedure a year ago. Uh, should I be taking iron supplements on a regular basis? You know, there's a, there's a much simpler solution if you're willing to do uh, just more red meat. <laughs> red meat is loaded with iron or, or beef liver. That's the best source because when you start taking iron supplements, the type that they give you, is not natural to the body. It's um, it's kind of a a chemical type iron that I don't I don't think works the same. So why don't you use something that uh, our bodies are used to from red meat or um, they even have supplements you can get that are spleen extract. Yeah, bovine spleen extract. Those those would handle I think a lot of different types of iron because it's not just about iron. It's also B12 and you get all the B vitamins. It's one big package. Uh, so. I would look at that. And um, the other thing that could interfere with your absorption of iron is that you might need more vitamin C or you might need more stomach acid. So don't forget about that because if your stomach's too alkaline, uh, you won't be able to absorb as much iron or even B12. So you'll find that uh, usually if someone's stomach is not acid enough, they'll usually have heartburn or GERD. Okay, very good. Question number three. Uh, interesting, uh, said, how does exposing the body to coal uh, trigger fat burning? And 60% of our respondents say that cold activates brown fat cells. 25% say it forces the body to work harder to maintain a c consistent core temperature. And 15% say that cold activates our my mitochondria. I think everyone's right. Um, you know, when you're, the body has this really, uh, um, kind of stabilizing message. You must keep uh, the temperature at 98.6 You because it's like a survival thing, right? Because as soon as your temperature gets too cold, boy, that can really throw off a lot of physiology. So uh, your body works really hard to uh, generate heat when it gets cold. And uh, brown fat, the reason why you have brown fat or the, the, way, the reason why it's brown is it's the concentrated mitochondria in that fat is like massive. So that's where you have so much mitochondria. And so what, the, what this does when you activate cold is uh, your whole, the whole thing, it, it switches to generating heat directly. It doesn't even like, your mitochondria don't even make ATP, it just makes heat, bam, bam, all this heat. And so you're wasting a tremendous amount of uh, calories. And that brown fat will also trigger other fat on your body and use that as fuel to generate heat. And it can actually reach out and 
use your glucose too. So it just, it's, it's like this incredible energy hog. So if you're trying to lose weight and you want to lose an extra hundred, couple hundred, several, or I don't know, several hundred calories of, of uh, calories just to burn those up, you can start thinking about um, cold therapies. And it doesn't have to be like a cold immersion. It can be cold showers. It could be going out in the cold and doing cold sports, ice skating, a snowball fight, Steve, you can do that. Um, so all these, uh, you know, cold, it's like, you don't, you're not, you're not doing anything. You're just changing the environment you're in, not even necessarily exercising and the body will start burning, burning fat. Isn't that cool? It is. But snowball fights, I, I cry like a toddler when they smack me right in the eye. Just awful. You don't want to do that, Steve. That then. might be therapeutic. Okay. Here's an interesting factoid, um, or question really. And go ahead, doc. Okay. Which country has a 94.5% obesity and overweight population rate? Ouch. You know, back in the 50s and 60s, it was look at the skinny girl, look at the skinny guy, and everybody wanted to build up muscles so they didn't have a caved-in chest. chest. Boy, has that changed. So, Well, this, this particular country is the fattest country in the world. So let's see if you can come up with that. All right, let's see. Why don't we go to San's mom uh, from Rumble again. Thank you, Rumble. My husband and I have been on carnivore keto for the last 10 months. What can we do to additionally to flush out any damage to the arteries we may have caused prior to this major change in our eating? Can you do anything about that, Doc? Well, as far as flushing out, I think y you want to think about um, your body has certain enzymes that help uh, detoxify chemicals and poisons, right? And so those are called phase one, phase two detoxification enzymes. And so those are in your liver, they're in your kidney, they're in different other places. And um, by getting enough of um, antioxidants, you can actually, you can help facilitate that. Now, there's two different things about antioxidants. Your body makes antioxidants, and you can take them from the diet, like from cruciferous vegetables, for example. So when you consume cruciferous vegetables, it not only gives you some of these antioxidants, it triggers your own genetics to make antioxidants like glutathione. So it's not just about giving it to you, it's like it does trigger it. Things can trigger antioxidants and trigger this glutathione as well. Uh, like exercise can do it. Cold therapy can do it. Fasting can do it. Um, sleeping can help. So all of these things contribute to cleaning things up. Um, so it's not just about taking a supplement. So you can do a lot of things to increase your own. And then that, that on the opposing side, the question is what, um, what, 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 um, destroys the body? What's like the worst thing you can do? Well, the more dead a food is, the, um, the more it um, destroys the body. So, so this is when we get into um, processed food. The ultimate of that would be ultra, ultra processed food, which is like junk food. It's so damaged, so altered that um, I'm just giving you guys the next question, but Basically, I'm going to give it to you now since you brought it up. <clears throat> so the definition of process means so altered to the point where it doesn't resemble nature anymore. It's like it's how many ways can you kill a food, right? Uh, processing it by like heat, temp freezing, pressure, chemicals, electricity. That's what they do, this food, to the point where it's like becomes deader than a doornail. So, And then you're going to eat that to try to get life or energy out of it. You can't get health or life out of something dead. So it has to have something in there that you can use. And that's what ultra processed food basically does. And that relates to this question that we're, we're bringing up now of how this one particular country became so overweight, which we'll discuss once we get the answers. Speaking of the answers, the question asked, uh, which country has a 94.5% uh, obesity uh, and overweight population rate. And 54% of our respondents say it's the good old USA. 26% say it's Samoa. That's the one I'm voting for. 
say it's India, and 10% say it's the Republic of uh, Nauru, located in the Oceanic Island of uh, Island Chain. Wow. Some... The answer is Nauru. Wow. Yeah, it's a South Pacific island. It's population 11,000, not too big. But they, were, they had this huge boom of um, uh, selling phosphate, which is a, a natural element that they had on their island. And they got really wealthy <clears throat> fast, and then they depleted all of this mineral. And then they went to a severe poverty situation where they – a hundred percent of the food is imported. You can't even use the land to grow anything. You can't even fish because 40% of the local uh, place is polluted. So you're literally depending on ultra processed foods for most of your calories. This is why a hundred percent of the country is completely obese. I mean, what's interesting is you have this push to, Oh, we need to feed the world because they're starving, but are you going to feed them ultra processed foods? Is that what we need to do is make more of those lab foods, artificial foods, fake foods, um, to then solve world, world hunger. Um, so it's interesting that you're eating this cheap food, but you become obese from it. Uh, almost a hundred percent of the population in that. Uh, and so it's, uh, and, and also they have the highest rate of, um, diabetes and, uh, completely just not probably unaware of what's, what, linking this connection but um so yeah that's you're eating dead food you're gonna it's just gonna rebound and destroy your body unfortunately okay here's a nice comment from paul from facebook dr berg has wakened my soul and i feel like a superhero thank you so um (laughs) profound effect and i hope you can get to those um those folks that have the 94.5 percent rate of obesity maybe they can hear some good stuff and by the way doc we're uh, racing against the clock, so I'd ask you to cheat again. Can you uh, read and answer this interesting question? Okay. What does the word processed mean in ultra-processed food? And, I, of course, I just defined it, but processed means altered, changed, modified to the point where it no longer resembles the original food. It's killing the food off, sterilizing it to the point where it's so dead I mean, I don't even know um, what would be worse than ultra-processed food. And uh, unfortunately, 83% of all the calories in the grocery store are ultra-processed foods. And um, apparently, children consume 67% of their calories ultra-processed foods. So um, definitely, we need to make some... We need to get everyone to actually tell people about this and get them off of it. It's going to be a... has to be a group effort because it's just like... It's just destroying people, especially kids. So, and then you don't want to start your kid kids out on this food either. That's that's the worst because as soon as they become teenagers, forget it. Right, Steve? Absolutely right. And here's our last comment question or whatever I think for the day. And this is from Karen on YouTube. What are the best ways? I know you've spoken about this to counter the effects of constant exposure. <clears throat> excuse me, to EMFs and five G transmissions, etc. <laughs> Yeah, you might want to get a cell phone that's not a 5G or um, I think um, I would start with your, com- you know, using this thing at a distance, at a distance, not right here. Um, keep it away from your head. Don't put it in your pockets. Um, I would also, with your computer, has to be far away from you. I, I have an e- EMF tester and I, I measured, boy, I was just bathing myself all day long in this EMF until I started measuring. I'm like, wow, this is it's all over the place. So it's going to be, it's like the next smoking. It's the cigarette. It's, it's, it's going to create problems. Um, so you want to minimize the damage. Um, anywhere where you have this electro fields or magnetic fields. So you can get a, it's called a tri field. I like the tri field one. It's really easy to look at. And, uh, <laughs> you can basically, um, take um, and measure and just see how bad things are around your environment. But on that note, um, thanks for sticking around this long. I appreciate your attention. I will see you next week, same time. And also I got some really interesting videos coming up. I think you'll enjoy.